OMG, baby, tell them. Hey there, welcome to Powered by Backers. It is Justin. I am here again. I'm joined by my guest, Ben Pfefferman. Ben, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So I'll do a quick little intro. So you, you wrote a bit of a quick intro, and then I've got a couple of things that I've, I've watched a couple of your videos. So you're the CEO of Amuka Esports, uh, which is Canada's leader in esports venues, leagues, and tournaments. Um, last year, you guys ran over 200 events um, at your venues in Toronto, Windsor, and online. You're an avid gamer, and you love to get killed by 10-year-olds on Fortnite. Um, so that's, that's, that's what you wrote. I also, so I, I watched that you're an aficionado of beards. I've been sort of growing mine in and out over the, uh, the COVID season here. Um, and you are on a plant-based diet, although I, are you still? We'll probably talk a little bit about that. Um, you are a grad from uh, Fredericton University MBA and Carleton Law as well, right? Yeah, very perfect, good. Perfect. Yeah. So um, we'll jump right into it. Let me start with probably a question you may or may not have ever had. I don't know. Amuka. I, I, I looked it up. It's either a place in, is, in Israel. Um, it, is, it means uh, something uh, he got up in Zulu. And I keep thinking of Prince Amukamara, cornerback in the NFL. So tell me, what is the meaning behind Amuka? Because I see you run Amuka Esports and Amuka Capital as well. So tell me a little bit about the meaning behind that name. Yeah, sure. It's a long personal story, but I okay. want to yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'll, I'll break it down for you. So uh, when my wife and I got married, okay. uh, you know, for s- several years, we had trouble having kids. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty spiritual person. So, um, you know, one time I met this rabbi who was traveling from Israel and um, so he came to my office and I told him, you know, we're, my wife and I were having some trouble. I'd love to get a blessing from you to have kids. He said, okay. no problem. This is a very standard thing. Um, but he said, but on one condition, which is kind of odd. And I said, okay, what? He says, I want to pick the name. Like, okay. okay, listen, I got nothing to lose. I don't have kids. Sure, man, this rabbi wants to pick the name. Pick the name. So he says, uh, okay, so the name you're going to give is, is Yonatan Uziel. Okay. I'm like, okay, you know, sounds good. Um, and then I said, but what if I'm going to – what if it's a girl? He's like, you're not having a girl. <laughs> okay. And I ended up having twin boys. Okay, so he was right. <laughs> so he was right. And uh, the name that he gave, uh, Yonatan Uziel, is a rabbi who was buried in a very small village in Amuka. Uh, and Amuka's- 135 people, that's the population. Yes. I looked and it up. A, and a really nice winery, too. Okay, there you go. Very good winery. Okay. So Amuka is a place where single people go every year to hopefully find their soulmate. There you um, go. Okay. So just like, you know, this, this, uh, this name gave me blessing in my personal life, when it came time to naming my company, I wanted to give it a name that that carried blessing. And yeah. So that's why I picked Amuka. And who knows? It's kind of cool and original. It's, it's, yeah, it's cool and original, right? But it, I mean, it's easily to pronounce, right? I mean, when you talk about brands and branding, right? It, I mean, it's got the, the, the meaning behind it for you. But from a brand perspective, it also makes it um, very easy to remember, right? It is. Sometimes I do get a lot of people confuse it with Akuma, the Street Fighter character. Okay. So that happens sometimes, but. I, I can't predict, you know. What right, I right, right. No, but I thought it was really cool. And so I'm glad that it was from the small sort of village, I guess, in Israel. But there was some other names as well, which you may may know or not know was Zulu. It's he got up. So your two little boys, they got up or yeah, very he, cool. got, he got them up. So anyways, I thought that was cool. So we'll transition right into esports, um, which I think um, personally, not a huge gamer presently but in my life you know original nintendo owner um so might tell you my age you know when it first came out um as a seven-year-old um you know played a lot of uh, counter-strike i lived overseas in korea um so played a lot of counter-strike back in sort of the early 2000s so a lot of that a lot of college days of nba live you know nfl blitz Uh, but tell us a little bit about the esports world and what brought you from, I believe you were in sort of investment banking um, into esports. And I actually watched your answer to this, but I'll ask it for our audience um, as well. 
what what uh, I believe there was a Trump inspiration there or sort of a um, but I, I won't ruin the, the story. Go ahead. Yeah. Tell us your tell us your uh, your foray from investment banking into esports. Yeah, so I think it really started. I also play those same games. I think we're probably around the same age. Yes. Um, and but you know, kind of in university, I stopped gaming because I just had other things going on. Right. Um, and uh, back in 2015, um, really just you know met someone at a party. He was running this esports business called Enthusiast Gaming. Back in 2015, no one knew really so, so much about esports. It was still in its early age. Right. Uh, but I liked the team. I rolled the dice. And, you know, I really, that's sort of what started my passion for it is following them and their journey. Um, so around the same time, I opened up my own investment bank and I was raising money for some real estate deals, tech deals, and then some esports. Um, and then, like, two things kind of happened. One, you know, I was at a conference and all these experts were there. And, like, I asked a pretty simple question and, like, no one knew the answer and I was right. kind, of, kind of surprised. I was thinking if these are the expert and he's like, this guy worked at a big investment bank. So if this is like thought leadership in esports right now, then, you know, like maybe I should weigh it. Like, you know, I, there's a bit of a void if you're saying, yeah, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I didn't consider myself an expert. I just sort of was casually following it, but I mean, right. it really, if that wasn't, a, if that wasn't there, um, made me really want to move into it. So um, I spent, I spent really the past year, like every waking moment, esports. I go to sleep listening to an esports podcast. I wake up listening to it, uh, consume all sorts of content to really, you know, be an expert on it. Um, and then also, you know, we were just raising money for companies and just no one really had a diversified strategy. Everyone was in team vertical or this vertical or that vertical. And then my business partner and I, we just said, let's just put this investment bank on hold. Let's go all in. Let's build our own org the way we want to build it. And that's how we launched the MOOC Esports. Right. And so, so tell me about the Trump inspiration. Not so much oh. that you were inspired by Trump, but the whole sort of quote. I think it was kind of an interesting little uh, quip, if you will. Yeah, I don't remember where I, I yeah, I remember telling someone that. Um, so yeah, like, I think it was at the White House. You're probably uh, like, shit, did I mention Trump? Now I have to keep mentioning it time and time again, but. No, no, no. My I apologies, just, sorry. No, yeah. not at all. I just forget yeah. where, where I told that story, but um, yeah. So Trump, Trump's moment was he was at the White House correspondence dinner, and you know Obama said, you know, like you'll never be president, and I like made that that statement to him, and that was kind of like the uh huh, I'm gonna do it. Right. Um, so that was kind of my moment, is being at this conference and you know like asking you know like some basic questions and seeing that people just didn't know, and I just kind of sat there being like uh huh. This is, this is going to be my moment. I'm going to be sitting in your chair. Right. It's interesting. Interesting. So um, I like the, the sort of the, the concept that you brought up there, and I, I was not familiar with it or I hadn't really thought of it, obviously. Um, you know, I, I recall back in 01, I lived in Korea, 01, 02, sort of 03 time frame. Um, and there was eSports or whatever the, the previous version of eSports was big. They were playing whatever game they were playing. It was on Starcraft. Team. Starcraft. Yeah, yeah exactly. They were, Play. It was on TV, like every other channel in Korea was playing that. I, From what I understand, um, some of the players were making, if not millions, like hundreds of thousands, the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and so it was, you know, it was pretty big back then. Um, you mentioned that you jumped in on the team side um, and that there's sort of three. Can you kind of explain the, the difference between sort of like, you know, the big, the big brands, um, the sort of gaming brands, the teams and then kind of the vertical that you've decided to kind of pick on more of the, the kind of, what did you, you gave it a term, like kind of the, the, the average gamer or the, you know, everyday gamer type thing. Yeah. Tell sure. us a little bit about what brought you to that and sort of where you see maybe that going. I, I'd love to hear kind of, you know, everyone talks about, you know, esports, right. But nobody really understands what that means as you've, as you've explained. So maybe give us a little bit of the verticals and your thought process on it. Sure. So let, let's let's go through some basic definitions. So everyone knows the video game industry. It is a 150 billion dollar industry. Right. Esports defined as playing video games at a competitive level, be it up here in front of 100,000 people and 30 million dollar prize pool, or with 15 friends, you know, trying to win 50 bucks in a beer league. That's esports. Okay. That industry is only 1.1 billion dollars. Okay. So, so relatively small. It's not even 1% of the right. video game industry. So 
this is when people think esports, they think it's huge. I think they're really thinking gaming is huge. Right. Gaming is bigger than Hollywood and the music industry combined. The esports industry is still relatively small, but growing. You know, it's growing at a very fast, you know, growth rate. Um, so within that esports ecosystem, at the top, you have game publishers, game developers. Um, they're all, you know, large publicly traded companies. Uh, there's probably four or five companies that really run the entire ecosystem. Uh, Tencent, uh, which is the biggest, you know, you can look at Activision Blizzard and Epic, um, which is also partly owned by Tencent. If you really go through the list, most Activision is actually also partially owned by Tencent. Right. Um, Valve, you know, and others. Right. So they're the gods, they control everything, and they've got the biggest piece of the pie by far, and it's not even close. Then below you have distribution. So how, are, how is gaming content, especially competitive on the esports side, how is that content gonna be delivered? Uh, through streaming sites. And that's where you have uh, Twitch, Twitch right. and YouTube and Facebook. Um, and there's gonna be some smaller entrants. You know, Tencent is gonna launch uh, their streaming platform. Uh, and in China and Asia, there's a lot of others. Um, so there's like three main ones in North America, but you know, that will mature. So those are the, that's the content. Um, the delivery distribution side. Distribution delivery, yeah, okay. Uh, then below it, you have teams. So okay. teams are a little bit complicated. Um, there are two types of teams. There's, fr there's franchises and non-franchises. So uh, franchise teams um, are similar to what we know uh, with professional sports, NBA, NFL, NHL. You buy a fee, you buy a franchise from the league. And there's a lot of stability and everything that's good with a franchise. Who runs the leagues, the, the major sort of brands or the distributors or where is that league run? So in the franchise, the game publishers run the league. Game publishers. Okay. So for, you know, Overwatch and Call of Duty, it's run by Activision. Right. Okay. And they have a commissioner and everything. Okay. Um, and then there's other games that operate more like golf and tennis, where if you're good enough, you can qualify. Right. And there's minor events and major events. Sort so of like a world series of poker, you might have play in games or PGA tour, you might have amateurs kind of playing in type thing. Yeah, exactly. And if you're good enough, you qualify and you get a lot of Cinderella stories on that side. Right. So, you know, in the traditional sports side, um, while some owners do own multiple teams, it's not as prevalent. In esports, you have to own multiple teams. Okay. And compete in different games. Right, right. Okay. There's different um, leagues. It's like owning an NFL team, uh, MLB team, NHL, NBA team, right? They're, they're all competing in different sports. Yeah, exactly. Like the equivalent would be like a, a typical esports owner would own an NBA team, an NFL team, a cricket team, a soccer team, uh, uh, you know, all sorts of teams, big, small. <laughs> Tennis players, golfers. Yeah, across the board. Five. Yeah, yeah. Polo, right. you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Water polo. I was watching one, Sporti Sportico Calicio. Look it up. It's, it's on one of those Netflix shows. And yeah. It's called Home Game. Crazy. They literally stand in the middle of the pitch, punching each other. Oh my God. That's legal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's in Italy somewhere. Anyways, continue on. Sorry. Yeah. All these, no, no, no. It's yeah, okay. it's, all yeah. these, um, and then, you know, sort of below that is like the amateur gaming ecosystem and that's right. where we play in. So, um, you know, when people ask uh, about uh, different games and what's popular, like to me, it makes no difference what games people are playing right. because I'm organizing the tournaments. Right, so if, if people are playing Overwatch, great, we'll have a gazillion Overwatch tournaments. As soon as Overwatch is not popular, right, like right now, great, we're all into Valorant. So like I have no risk when it comes to game trends. Um, right. And that's the biggest challenge for team owners is if you drop $25 million on a Overwatch franchise and people stop playing, like you're pretty fucked. Yeah. There's not much you can do. So right. um, yeah, so that's where we play in that amateur, like everyday guys coming out, playing, competing, et cetera. Cool, so you host events. Um, so I, I watched another video you, you just recently, and I don't know how recent this was, took over a venue uh, from, was it Wave Gaming or something along those lines? Um, so one of the largest, I guess, gaming centers in the GTA or, or I forget what sort of area. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, so you've taken that over and so you guys obviously host events. So how does that work? If I'm a, I'm a uh, you know, average gamer, what do, I, what do I do and how does all that work? Yeah. Yeah. We, we made two acquisitions. So we have two venues right now. We have waves gaming in Toronto. It's the largest esports venue in Canada. Okay. Um, and we have a second cool. location in Windsor. Okay. How big uh, is, 
when you say large, how big is, is uh, the Waves Gaming Center? Yeah, it's 14, 000, over 14,000 square feet. Wow, okay, so that's, yeah, that's really big. How many, gamer, how many gamers do you get it? How many gamers can you get in there at one time? What's the most you've ever had? I think according to the piece of paper on the door, uh, four, <laughs> 450. Okay. okay. That's, your, that's your fire capacity, right? With yeah. COVID though, 250 or yeah, 150, right. right? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. Um, so, you know, so you host events. What, when was the last event? Like, have you hosted any throughout COVID or has that kind of been a bit of a damper on things or... Yeah, so, so before COVID, you know, we would, or, we would organize anywhere from five to seven uh, tournaments a week. So okay. there's two, two types of ways you could play. You could just come in and, you know, have, have a membership here, play on our computers whenever you want. Okay. You know, just on your own with your friends, whatever. Uh, or you can compete in tournaments. So, you know, I'll give you an example. T um, Tuesday nights, you know, we do a sports league. So why is someone going to come play uh, FIFA or NHL when they could play at home? So the difference is that when you play and compete in our sports league, we give you that professional game experience. You're on stage, huge production. It's all streamed. There's casters. There's, you know, Justin dumps the puck behind the net, chases it up. Like, you know, so you get that professional feeling and experience that you would never get playing at home. So right. that, that's the difference. Like, that's why I'm not competing with, playing Xbox at home, go ahead. But if you want that premium competitive gaming experience, that's why people come here. Okay, cool. So, so let's paint that picture a little bit more. So let's say I show up, you've got 450 people potentially. Let's say there's 200 in the tournament, right? Um, are all 200 playing at the same time or there's maybe two on stage or 10 on stage, let's say if they're playing some sort of team game and they're controlling individual players. Is that sort of the concept? Yeah, so generally with a tournament, um, we'll just do one – there's just one team can be on stage at, at a time. Okay. Um, if we do stream an event, um, generally there's just one stream for a smaller event. If it's a big event, we could do multiple streams. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you, you would play, you'd compete, and, you know, we'd, the tournament organizer will sort of figure out who's going to go on stage. Um, right. and try to give everyone that opportunity. Throughout, um, the, throughout but, the weeks or the months kind of thing. Yeah, if you're playing, let's say if it's a two or three hour tournament, you know. Um, oh, throughout the whole, like even just throughout that day, you, you'll have a chance to get up on stage. At yeah, some well, point. yeah, yeah, we'll try to, you know, we try to yeah. get as many matches as possible. Obviously, yeah, yeah. We can't, but um, if you play a couple times, you know, you're going to have that opportunity to be on stage. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I'll throw this out here. I actually, about two years ago, I was thinking about esports a little bit. You know, we do a lot of, you know, we work with different entrepreneurs and stuff. Um, you look at starting different businesses and we thought of Olympics. So I got the domain and we were looking at ways to maybe launch an Olympics where it would, the concept would be sort of like what you're doing, maybe different. I could be at different levels and you'd have the same players, maybe like a decathlon come in and play 10 games, 10 different, like different games. So maybe they play FIFA and maybe they're playing, you know, uh, world of Warcraft or, you know, whatever, um, could be old games, new games, whatever. And then you'd have some sort of cumulative, or you could have representatives from a country playing different games. Yeah. And then you have some sort of cumulative anyways. Um, what do I think of the idea? Yeah, what do you, I guess, sure. I wasn't going to ask that, but yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So I think that would be interesting in like a celebrity capacity. Like right. if you had two big streamers to go through that, um, like again, it would be hard to get Roger Federer and uh, Tiger Woods, you know, to go head to head at 10 different sports. It's just so different. But to do it um, online for sure, that'd be. Yeah. And especially like for yeah. celebrities or charity, it'd be really yeah. cool. Um, but the Olympics, you, uh, that's a trigger word for me. Um, you know, so there's a lot of talk about people in the esports industry want, um, want esports to be at the Olympics. And, okay. As a, as a sport in the real Olympics. Yeah, and I'm totally against that. So, so against that. And again, I'm the biggest esports evangelist out there. But the the Olympics is like this, like outdated, broken, corrupt brand that like loses money for like so many cities. Oh yeah. And it's like totally on the down. And esports is on the up. So why yeah, are we well, associate? That's why you create the Olympics. You don't yeah. need the Olympics. Yeah, you yeah. create the Olympics. 
Um, I, yeah, we don't need to get into the, the uh, financials or of the Olympics and how they bankrupt every city that they go to. Yeah, um, but it'd be really cool to see multi, it's a really cool idea. Like I'd love to see like some big streamers go head to head in, in, in like 10 different games. Be right, cool. and it, it could be sports, it could be, I mean, I, I don't want to claim to know any of the current games, like talked about Fortnite, you know, on, on your bio there, but, or the intro, but you know, maybe they pick three or four, you know, current, you know, popular games, not sports related at all. And they just play, you know, a, a match in each of those. And it can be different players. And maybe you have a team represented, you know, whether it's a country, I think the country aspect would be cool, because that would more align with the traditional sort of Olympics, but uh, it'd be the Olympics. Anyways, maybe we could we could continue that. We'll table that for another discussion another time. Um, I, have, I have another question and then we'll sort of tail into some, you know, I'll, I'll ask you, you know, sort of your thoughts on a couple of things. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I thought was really cool, um, and I'm just going to click over here just to look at it. So level six esports incubator. Um, I, I, you know, obviously it's on your bio, but I watched you talk a little bit about it in a, in a different video. And I saw another clip about it as well. Um, tell me a little bit about the thought process of level six, the incubator and what you guys are, if, if you're still doing it or, or what you're trying to do um, and, and where that sort of could lead to, I guess, for people. I don't want to give away the, the secret sauce as you're going to tell us, but tell us about level six, the incubator. Sure. Uh, it really became, you know, as we were looking to, you know, invest and acquire esports companies, I, I, I saw a ton of decks, tons of companies would send me, and I'd look at tons of them. And I was always very surprised the lack of sort of basic business acumen that a lot of early stage esports entrepreneurs had. They're passionate about their product or service. Uh, someone sent me a deck and like mixed up revenue and expenses, you know, like very, very basic things like that. So I was thinking, and the other part is, you know, often when we'd make a investment or acquisition, you don't have a lot of time to date. You just got to like look at some numbers, have a couple right. of calls. And I always hated that. So I wanted to create level six to give early stage esports entrepreneurs the opportunity uh, to go through a program, to learn from experts. And we have, we have guys from, we have the um, senior esports manager from Ubisoft. We have uh, top executives from Overactive Media, um, esports professors, so, you know, CTOs, um, to go through a great program um, so that they learn how to run an esports business, especially from the business side. Um, and in addition, it would give us a good opportunity to work with these companies um, over a prolonged period of time. And if things were good, then, you know, we'd want to invest or acquire them. So right. uh, we are on Friday is actually the first cohort is finishing. Um, we're doing a live pitch. So all the companies we've prepped them, we've, we've helped with their, with their, um, their decks. We've designed them in certain many cases. Uh, so they're going to do a live pitch. Um, and then hopefully they'll be ready to, you know, go out there and raise capital and grow their companies. That's awesome. I mean, that's literally what we do with backers. We have cohorts of entrepreneurs that come to us looking to raise capital and we go through a 90 day accelerator and basically, you know, guide them through that process. And then they're able to launch a campaign. So maybe I didn't really know the connection, but maybe we can get some of your companies uh, launching campaigns on our platform uh, to raise crap, raise capital from the crowd. So essentially we're a equity crowdfunding uh, platform. So gives you that extra avenue outside of your typical, you know, VCs or high net worth or accredited investors to actually get money from the gamers themselves or the, you know, the everyday investor, the retail investor. So it's sort of like a private equity uh, securities exchange that backers. That's what we like. So, yeah. So I, I think our company is listed on, maybe it's one of your competitors front funder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We're like, so, yeah. That, so, that, so you guys are raising capital. So, so interesting that you're on front funder. So what, are, what is the capital that you're raising on there? Yeah. So we um, we're doing like a $500,000 post seed round right. or call it kind of a bridge round. Um, we already got almost half of it when we started the campaign going into it and right. kind of crowdfunded, you know, almost, almost the rest of it. Okay. And what, what's sort of the minimum investment for an investor on there? 250. 250. And what do you guys pay? Is there a fee? Do you pay a fee on the back end? G give yeah. our, give our, yeah. give our users some competitive 
insight. Yeah, I don't want to okay talk with about that. I don't want to give I'm them okay any. with that. I know, I know what they charge. They charge eight and eight, um, eight percent upfront cash and eight percent broker warrants, and then they charge you an upfront fee. I'm very yeah, aware. Could be seven and seven, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, so that's fine. The the only difference is they use typically will use an OM exemption, so an offering memorandum exemption versus yeah. the actual uh, crowdfunding exemption. So. We kind of play in a, in a slightly different space. We'll go as low as $100 per investor because we've significantly reduced the costs um, on, the, on the actual investment and management of the investment. Um, so you can actually make it more accessible to even more people. Even though 250 is still a pretty reasonable number, um, you can go down as low as 100. So, um, and as low as raising 100,000. So it's, it's an interesting you know, dynamic front funder, great company. I mean, I've met them, been to events with them, great guys. Um, so, you know, no, no harm, no foul. We, uh, we're all friends in this space. Maybe they don't think so. I don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm okay with it. Competition's good. What's that? Yeah. Do you guys have an EMD behind it? We do. Uh, so we actually, our platform is different from a front funder. We are actually a software as a service. So we license our software to EMDs. So we're jurisdictionally agnostic, meaning that we can have a dealer licensing more like Shopify where you, know, you have store owners license the use of Shopify's software to open a store. We license the use of our software to an EMD and they open up the securities exchange. So we'll have, we'll have dealers uh, across Canada and across the US. Um, so you'll have the backers brand, um, kind of like Remax with brokers you know, all over. Um, we'll have brokers or dealers all across the country uh, and across the US. So slightly different model, more retail focused versus, you know, accredited or high net worth, but you know, it is what it is, right? We're all, we're all having fun. Yeah. Um, so we should definitely talk. Yeah. I definitely want to connect with you after about that. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, good luck. So if, if I guess I can't pitch for you, but tell everyone what they should do, where they should go just quickly. What to, to invest in our company. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. yeah so, uh, for retail investors, um, you know, we're listed on front funder. There's, uh, I think about 15 days left in the campaign. Um, and then we're also on deal square for, for brokers. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's more of their sort of a bit of a partnership there. Cool. Um, so let's, let's talk about yourself. Um, I think you went from being an investor, um, to sort of now the investee, if you will, the issuer, um, how has that transition been like you, you, have you been, um, an entrepreneur prior to this, or have you run a company prior to Amuka, or is this sort of your first entrepreneurial venture? And how has that been? Yeah. So one of the things, by the way, next time I'm on the show, hopefully I'm going to say you can find us on backers. Uh, it's all good. Fine. At least, at least it's evidence. For next ra- for yeah. Next yeah. Round. For your next round, a million dollars on backers on the, you know, the, the 108 securities uh, platform, right? So on one of our, our dealer platforms for yeah. sure. So that'd yeah. be cool. Um, maybe we'll have you on front 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 or be one of our dealers. Who knows? Yeah. Anything's possible. Yeah. Um, the way we're working, but that's cool. So tell us a little bit about, so we'll work on that. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, we'll work on you getting on the backers platform or some of your companies. Um, but yeah, tell us a little bit about your background from, you know, I guess law to MBA or did you actually pass the bar? Like, did you, did you become a lawyer or no? No. You did an undergrad in law? I hated then, law. You hated law? Okay, all right. I wasn't sure whether I should tread that way or because I obviously, anyways, that the simple answer, you hated law. Um, so you got in sort of the investment side. Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to to kind of wanting to even launch a MUCA versus staying in the corporate side. Yeah. Um, outside you know, of there was a need. Outside of there was a need kind of thing, just personal yeah. side. Yeah, the first business I started was in film production. Okay. Um, so I, I ran my own uh, business, you know, film production business, produced a couple documentaries. Um, I had an idea to shoot this movie in India about like, about like uh, you know, I'm Jewish and a lot, of, a lot of Jews are very into Eastern spirituality, meditation. So I, I knew nothing about filmmaking. I just bought a camera and a ticket to India and went there for almost a year to film it. Um, and then this is like way before digital. I like I had a back. I was carrying tapes, like literally mini DV tapes in my backpack the whole time. 
Um, and I remember, you know, I said, if I'm going to go through all of this, you know, what's the difference between a hobby and a profession? Right. Money. Getting, getting paid, paid for it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I said, I just want to get into one film festival. This whole project, like, will be worth it. And I made, like, I had to do DVDs. I had to mail them. So I made about 80 DVDs and I sent them to every single Jewish, uh, every single film festival, Jewish, non-Jewish, whatever. And everyone, Toronto said, no, 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 no. And finally it was like coming to the end of like all the rejections. And um, I, I get a notice from the Athens Jewish Film Festival. I'm like, holy crap, <laughs> Athens. Like I'm fucking going to Greece. Like this is insane. This is right. huge. And it's like, yeah, we're really excited to have you in Athens, Georgia. I was going to say, it was going to be <laughs> Athens somewhere in the U.S. Yeah, yeah that's... Yeah. But, hey, you know... <laughs> Still <laughs> Athens. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's, so, cool. you know what? It was great just to be selected to a film festival, to get yeah. out there, to speak, so... What was the what was the movie on? Sorry, I, I didn't catch that. Did you say what the topic of the movie was? Yeah, so it's, it's like kind of a travelogue where okay. I go to different ashrams around India. Okay. Um, and meet some of the Jewish people who are practicing. Okay. So yeah, you mentioned that. Okay. Um, that's cool. So that, that when, what, when was that? What year was that in? Like when would that have been? Uh, it was the same year of the uh, great economic collapse. So like it was 09, actually, 08, 09, uh, somewhere around there? Of, yeah, I think it was like 2010? fall of 08, 08? I think. Okay. Um, and I actually went two weeks before the Mumbai terrorist attacks. Okay. It was like a very, very, I started like, it was a very tense time in India. Like right. my parents, everyone was like, don't go. India is going to go to war with Pakistan and all that. But um, yeah, anyway, I had, had time of my life. Yeah, that's cool. So, so that kind of, so let's talk, I'll go back to the sort of the question a little bit. I, my, my apologies. I guided you the wrong way. What, what are like, as a, you went from being an investor to an investee, what are some thoughts on that process? You know, what have you learned? Maybe I guess we'll go with that direction. What have you learned um, from being on both sides of the fence a little bit? Okay, got it. Yeah. So like I, I've been an investor like since I was trading my bar mitzvah money, you know, okay. like, you know, so I've always been an online trader, very active. Um, and then, you know, when we opened up our own EMD in 2017, um, we were working with different issuers. Okay. Nah, now, now we can talk, you know, talk the language. Now you could be an EMD for backers. You can yeah, actually am, launch, you can launch your own, yeah, yeah there, there you go. You can launch your own uh, portal on the backers platform and yeah. you could facilitate your own. So level six in theory could have its own portal uh, facilitating equity crowdfunding that's on the cool backers idea. platform. Yeah, that's, so, so I could put I could put all four level six companies on board them to our EMD on, on your own on your own EMD on our platform that we've built out. Do I have to do any KYC or it's all done online? We do all it's all digitally, so we do it. We handle everything. Yeah, yeah. So as so we're actually right now in the process of rolling out the first wave or the first first cohort, um, and then we uh, we'll be starting to look for other EMDs dealers as you know we refer to them. So exempt market dealers just. For the crowd out there, an EMD is an exempt market dealer. Um, they are licensed to trade in securities um, in various jurisdictions. So I would assume you would be an Ontario registered EMD or yeah, Canada wide potentially. Uh, um, I think we're registered in Ontario, Alberta, and BC. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of different pr provinces. So um, yeah, so you could you could raise capital in any of those three provinces under the crowdfunding exemption. So. Although BC has slightly different rules, Alberta slightly different rules, so it might be different um, exemptions that you would use or different uh, regulatory frameworks, but essentially there is a sort of crowdfunding rule in every province. Wow, okay. So you'd use right. our software and you roll out with a, um, it's call it, we call it like a gray labeled, um, so it's not completely white labeled, it's powered by backers, but it's a gray labeled uh, standalone funding portal. Yeah. Under the backers okay, platform. Man, I love that. We should, okay. We should that's, roll it out. That's so, what we do. So anyways, um, so that's cool. So you have the EMD. Yeah. Um, you and, got into that. And then sort of transition from there. So we were working with all these issuers and like, they all suck. Like they're just. No, you don't. No, you don't guys. No, I'm just kidding. All <laughs> you suck. do have a lot if to learn. Watching yeah, this, yeah, you yeah. know who you are. Yeah. yeah. Um, but just like <laughs> the reporting, like, you know, with the Mookie esports, I give every single month. Every month I give a corporate update to investors 
and right. I have to like pull teeth to get a quarterly update out of people. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Like I've always believed that, you know, the more you share, the more people understand. And like right. after working with so many shitty issuers, um, you know, now that I'm on the other side, raising capital, um, I, I just do everything that I wish those issuers would provide for me when I was a dealer and investor. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, part of our sort of best practice is definitely at minimum quarterly reports. Um, but the way we've set it up with sort of the backers concept is a lot of them are your customers, clients, users, and investors, right? Because they are retail investors. Um, so you're, you're often, you know, just your everyday social media feed is kind of an update in what you're doing. If you, and it gives you that opportunity to give, you know, some feedback. It's not, it doesn't have to be a financial report, but you know, updates on, Hey, we just moved into, you know, a new building or we just did this or signed this new deal or whatever the, you know, sort of new updates and the people following along can take that in as, Hey, you know what? Things are happening right on a, almost on a daily basis, right? That, that open dialogue, that open communication uh, with your backers. But that's cool. I feel like like I'm pitching here to you almost. My it's apologies. Good. Sorry to it's you guys good. in the world. I, I just love that you're an EMD, yeah. you're raising capital, you've raised capital, or so you're raising capital, you've been an investor, and my hands go away every once in a while with the green screen. But um, yeah, it's, that's kind of amazing. So now you're the entrepreneur. Um, tell, tell us a little bit about, or tell the audience, um, your thoughts on becoming an entrepreneur and what are maybe, um, this might be sort of, we'll, we'll end it with this, some tips or ideas, um, that you've learned, you know, maybe from being on the other side. Now you realize as an entrepreneur, what are some things that, uh, that you've learned or experienced yeah, some, so, some mistakes you've made? Yeah. Oh my God. Like when I look at, Again, Amuki Sports, this is really just a one-year company. Like right. everything we've done is just in 12, 13 months. Um, when I look at how we structured a deal when we started and I look at how we deal now, I mean, it's, it's light years ahead. And I, I think at the end of the day, you're going to make mistakes. And we, I can say for sure we've made some. Um, we've made some bad investments. Uh, we've passed on some great investments. Right. And, and you learn from it. And I think you got to lick your wounds and you get back up. And, you know, just like in the trading world, you know, if you, if you get hit hard and you can never recover, like you're never going to see that upside. So, um, listen, being an entrepreneur is not for everyone. It's a lot of stress. It's a lot on your shoulders. Um, there's no five o'clock for me. I never check out of my company. It, Tell I, everyone what time is it right now in yeah. real time? It's yeah. nine 30. I'm at a, a hotel in Niagara. We were supposed to do this earlier. It didn't work out. You're, you know, and I appreciate that you're taking the time at nine 30 at night not 9.30 a.m., 9.30 p.m., um, and you're still at the office, you know, we're still working, right? So that's a testament to the true sort of entrepreneurial spirit, and I appreciate you being here as well. Yeah, so. no, no problem. So you, you live and breathe and, and eat your company. Like, everything I do is, is eSports. Everything I do is Amuka. Uh, I have everything riding on this. This means so much to me, so much to my family, and I have a real chip on my shoulder. Like, I, there's a lot of people who said I can't do it, and I'll never raise money or I'll never do this. And like, I'm just so determined to prove them all wrong and to do this for myself, you know, more than anything. And all the shareholders on, you know, from front funder or our first round, like everyone who's trusted me with their money, like I want to prove them right and, you know, prove all the haters wrong. Cool. And backers on your second round, um, all the, the all the investors round. from backers on your second round or from your own EMD, you can actually raise money through our software using your own EMD. So you don't even have to go. We can discuss that another time. Um, so you mentioned in a quick note, well, one, I have two things. I don't want to take too much more of your time. Obviously, it's getting later. Um, one is you mentioned that you had a story about, you'd watched the previous okay. show of ours, uh, a, Bills, a Bills story, Buffalo Bills. So the NFL hopefully is coming back soon enough. Um, are you a Bills fan? Kind of, yeah, kind of. <laughs> Uh, okay, that's fine. I mean, I don't, most people won't admit it. I, I mean, I'm a Bills and a bit of a Bengals fan, but um, I got my orange Bengals shirt on. But yeah, tell us a little bit of what, what's the story of, you have about the Bills. Yeah, so yeah, when you told me about the show, you know, I wanted to see, I, I didn't hear about it. And, you know, I always want to make sure I'm coming on quality programming, which I am. And, uh, and so when I, saw, when I saw the talking about the Bills, so, you know, I have four kids and um, I don't get to, 
travel much and get out, but I was able to go to Vegas for the Super Bowl. Oh, wow. In okay. Arizona. And like, and this is right before Corona. Like literally this is like end of February before like, I, I actually think I got Corona there. It came back so sick. But anyway, another story. <laughs> okay. And I'm just like, we're in some like shady casino and I'm just, um, we were betting on like the Raptors that night or something. Okay. And uh, I said, you know what? I want to do something that if it goes well, we'll make sure all of us guys come back to Vegas next year. So like put some good money down on the bills to win the Super Bowl. Um, and it's a, a very substantial win that it would I would, I could afford to bring everyone down if we win. So what's, what are the odds on the bills winning the Super Bowl? Right. Uh, that, so that was last year during the Super Bowl for this coming, like for this yeah. coming Super Bowl. Yeah, what what were the odds? Like a uh, couple thousand to one? No, no. It's like 30 something to one. 30 to one. Okay. So they're not, that's yeah, that's not bad odds. It could come true and they're at, they have a good shot. So uh, if the Bills make it to the Super Bowl, I'm going to go down to Vegas um, with all my buddies who are there. And if I win, it'll You pay for everyone's trip. trip. There you go. It'll all right. The whole trip for everybody. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. That's, that's actually a really cool story. So good luck. Go Bills. Um, right. Right. So we'll, we'll end with this last question. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to an entrepreneur, um, either as an entrepreneur yourself or um, as an investor, what would that one piece of advice be? Yeah, um, I really don't remember where I heard it, um, but don't uh, don't go for yes, go for no's. Try to get as many no's as you can. Like the hardest part about being a CEO and running a startup is fundraising, and it's just no, no, no. Um, and you know, you just you gotta grind it out. And if you have that resilience to get to get past it, to accept defeat to accept that everyone's going to have you're too early. And then I, then we do well and we have a nice round. Oh, but I wish I got an earlier and like, right. like whatever. Your valuation's everyone, too high now. I'm whatever. Yeah. Right. Like everyone's yeah. going to give yeah. you the reason and it's okay. Like you don't need to, not everyone needs to invest. I don't care, but it's a grind. It's a huge time suck to do it. Right. Um, but if you're committed and you, you have the perseverance um, it's, you know, that's what's going to make or break you. So, yeah, no. And, and I mean, entrepreneurship in general, that's, I mean, it's, it, you know, I take it from sort of my experience was in sales, you know, every no is one step closer to a yes was sort of the, the mindset, right? So you just kind of keep pushing. You want to hear those no's because, you know, eventually you're going to get that yes. Um, oh, I, I remember the context. It was that if you keep, if you go for a yes, when you get a no, you're, you feel defeated, right? Right. But if you know, but if you go for no's, then, you know, it's only up from there, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't collect those no's. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So perseverance. I, a lot of people mention that on the show. This is probably about the 25th time I've done this. We've got a whole series now of, of people kind of lined up. I took a bit of a break. I was, you know, was away for a bit. But um, Ben, I want to thank you very much. Well, actually, before we go, where can people find your website, I know you've got a whole bunch of social medias on there. Um, where can they find your, you know, your Facebook, your YouTube, give us some of your, uh, your handles, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. Website. We're, on, we're on everything. I'm Uki Esports, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, me personally, best place to get me is LinkedIn. I feel like all those social media sites are all t too toxic and I stay in my business bubble on LinkedIn. So best ways that, that's where we connected. That's definitely yeah. the best, best way to get me. Um, and, uh, if you're in Toronto, come by waves gaming. And if you're in Windsor, come yeah, by where Windsor. is, where is the waves gaming? Just out of curiosity, where is it located? Yeah. It's at Dufferin and Steele's sort of right next to York university. Okay. And then in Windsor, where's the, I'm not familiar with Windsor, but for those people in Windsor, where would it be? It's in Windsor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just look it up in Windsor. That's on the corner of walk and don't walk. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, Ben, thank you very much for joining me. Um, enjoy your evening and all you out there watching i'll see you guys again tomorrow all right. omg baby tell them